good afternoon. We'd like to invite everyone to please settle down and as we begin in a short while. Good afternoon, everyone. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues in the government and academe, ladies and gentlemen. I am Andrea, and I have the honor of being your moderator for today's Mabini Dialogue. The Foreign Service Institute, in partnership with the Department of Foreign Affairs, Office of United Nations and International Organizations, welcome you to today's Mabini Dialogue on the rising tide of climate migrants, the nexus of migration, climate change, and human rights. We'd also like to welcome our guests from all over the world who are joining us via late, uh, Facebook live stream. So today's Mabini Dialogue explores the nexus of migration, climate change, and human rights. As we gather here, the importance of this topic resonates deeply with us, particularly because of our shared experiences the Philippines an archipelagic state, and Guyana, the home country of our distinguished speaker, a small island developing state. Both nations acutely understand the challenges climate change brings to our shores. As we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this dialogue becomes even more poignant, reminding us of our collective commitment to uphold and protect the rights of, and dignities of those most vulnerable to the consequences of ch climate change. So to formally and wait, we also would also like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Ores Nowasad, who is uh, the Human Rights Treaties Branch Office of the High Commissioner for, uh, for Human Rights. So uh, to formally begin our program, I would, also, I would like to call on stage Dr. Stephanie Beatriz Ovalera, Executive Director of the Foreign Service Institute, to, for the welcome remarks. Thank you, Andy. Ambassador Rosario G. Manalo, Assistant Secretary Maria Teresa Almuela of UNEO, Professor Dr. Bertrand Ramjaran, Mr. Ores Novasad, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, colleagues in government. I wish to acknowledge the presence of Ambassador Eileen Bugarin, Ambassador Minda Cruz, ASEC Bobby Ferrer, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And welcome to the Mabini Dialogue on the Rising Tide of Climate Migrants, the nexus between climate change, migration, and human rights, organized in partnership with the DFA's United Nations and International Organizations Office. This dialogue comes at an opportune time in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, UDHR, also in light of COP28, as nations gather to discuss actions to address climate change. This threat, recognized as having cross-sectoral implications, affects various areas, including migration and human rights. 
The Philippines, due to its geographical position, faces significant challenges from climate change. The situation has necessitated migration as an adaptive strategy, encompassing everything from temporary displacement caused by natural disasters to labor mobility due to the erosion of livelihoods. Highlighting the importance of this issue, Foreign Affairs Secretary Enrique Manalo at the 114th session of the International Organization for Migration Council last November stated, and I quote, in a world of increasing climate-induced human mobility, the role of safe and orderly migration with full protection of the human rights of migrants becomes even more important, end of quote. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming Dr. Bertrand Ramcharan, a distinguished former acting UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and an esteemed academic. His dual experience as a practitioner in human rights and an academic provides us with a unique opportunity to gain insights into the intersections of human rights, climate change, and migration. We also have Mr. Ores Novasad, Human Rights Protection Officer at the Office of the, human, of the High Commission for Human Rights. A critical question arises in this context. How can the international community collaborate more effectively to mitigate the factors driving climate-induced migration? This inquiry calls us to examine the obligations of individual nations in protecting the human rights of those displaced by the impacts of climate change. In honoring the spirit of the UDHR and acknowledging the formidable challenges posed by climate change, our collective goal must be to create a future where human rights are upheld and strengthened despite the rising tides. I look forward to your talk, sirs, and the ensuing discussions, which I trust will not only deepen our understanding but also ignite a collective impetus for meaningful global action. Thank you and mabuhay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Valera, for your welcome remarks. Now, uh, please allow me to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. G. Ramcharan, Bertrand G. Ramcharan is a distinguished figure with a rich academic and professional background. A barrister of Lincoln's Inn in London, he holds a de degrees in philosophy, history, and law. His impressive 34-year career at the United Nations includes serving as chief speechwriter for the UN Secretary General, director of the International Conference in the former Yugoslavia, and director in the UN Political Department. He also held the positions of deputy and then acting high commissioner for human rights. Beyond his UN career, Dr. Ramcharan has been a prominent academic, serving as a professor at the Geneva Graduate Institute and the University of Ottawa, as well as holding visiting professorships at Columbia University and Lund University in Sweden. His commitment to education con con continued as chancellor of the University of Guyana. So his expertise in human rights and international law has been recognized through his roles as a member of the UN Human Rights Council's high-level panel on human rights in Darfur and an ILO Commission of Inquiry on, human right, on Labor Rights. Dr. Ramcharan is also a prolific author with notable works including Contemporary Human Rights Ideas, Contemporary Preventive Diplomacy, The Advent of Universal Protection of Human Rights, and a Global Handbook on National Human Rights Institutions. So in recognition for, of his contributions to international jurisprudence, the Caribbean Court of Justice Academy honored him in October 2019 by inducting him into its first honor roll as the eminent Caribbean international jurist. So ladies and gentlemen, with a warm round of applause, let us welcome Professor Dr. Bertrand G. Ramcharan. And uh, I'll also call uh, Mr. Nowasad to please uh, have a seat in front. Ladies and gentlemen, I came here on Sunday and I was saying to the foreign minister last evening that there is, and the 
permanent secretary, of, uh, the chief of staff of the foreign minister, I was saying, what a richness you have here as a people, as a ministry, and what a richness you have in your explorations of the issues facing the world and facing your region. After I left the United Nations, I did a full degree in philosophy, which is why the introduced her. So. And um, one of the things I discovered was Socrates. And Socrates' greatness was that he understood that he knew very little. So I come before you today as a man who is ready to dialogue with you, but a man who understands that he doesn't know very much. So now, I want to acknowledge Ambassador Rosario Manalo. I happen to be here because Oris Nausad and I, my friend, we work together in the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And Ambassador Manalo is a distinguished member and former chair of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. By the way, in the Human Rights Quarterly, which comes out of Johns Hopkins University Press. There is an article in one of the recent issues, if not the last one, the, the one before that, which has a discussion of the impact of two of the United Nations human rights treaty bodies, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And the author of the article um, makes the case that perhaps the most significant impact of a United Nations human rights treaty body was Ambassador Manalo's uh, Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And why? Because the committee has been able to develop a jurisprudence on very difficult issues such as what is the responsibility of the state to protect a woman who has been the subject, the victim of violence against an ex-spouse. I use that as one of the examples in the article. So, I was introduced to Ambassador Manalo sometime last year. There's a dispute as to who raised it first, but I acknowledge from Ambassador Manalo and Oris Novosad that I, that according to them, I asked her if she knew General Romulo. I did a book called Asia and the Drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I, I'm not trying to impress you, I'm reasoning with you. I did another book called Africa and the Universality of Human Rights. And I've always thought that Carlos Romulo, his role in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has been overlooked. And in presentations that I made yesterday, twice, I tried to bring out, and the Foreign Secretary himself brought it out, and the President of the University of the Philippines brought it out. Romulo was rather influential in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Romulo thought that the world should be a world ruled by law. Romulo thought that the laws of all states and institutions of all states should be in conformity with the United Nations Charter. Romulo emphasized, along with René Castan of France, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights must be based on the principle of the unity of all humankind. And then when they, the opening article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights reads as follows, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit, they say brotherhood, I notice that the ASEAN declaration says, in a spirit of humanity. That's, so I always trick, uh, uh, cheat when I come to this part of brotherhood because the time was different. Anyhow, so cut a long story short, we discussed and we researched a, li a little publication on the role of Romulo in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I was able to give the Foreign Secretary a copy of, uh, it's not published anywhere, but I had it printed. And I wonder if I might give it to the Distinguished Chief of Staff.
So now that's how come I happen to be here. And Ambassador Manalo and Oris Nausad, they have it in mind that they would expand this and that there would be a book on around the contribution of Romulo and the Philippines' contribution to human rights. That's how come I'm here. And now you've asked me to join you in a reflection today on this issue of the rising tide of climate migrants, the nexus of migration, climate change, and human rights. I never read a lecture, so don't be, don't be concerned that I'm going to read something. This is not automatically my subject. And so I had to think it through. And what I want to do together with you today is I want to touch on three sets of issues. I want to touch first on the literature. I want to touch next on some issues of policy. And I want to touch next on some principles that might help us to take this discussion forward. Let me remind you that in the problem that is presented for discussion today, or the problem that was sent to me from the Foreign Service Institute, you are presenting the following six issues. Most of the 59.1 million internally displaced persons in 2021 were due to climate disasters. The crisis, too, the crisis, while universal, disproportionately affects vulnerable regions, like, and that Southeast Asia provides a microcosm of this global challenge. I need to reason with you. This is what you've asked me to speak to. That's why I'm, I'm summarizing the issues that you present to me. Three issues of the right to life, liberty, and security. I notice you have framed the discussion in terms of the right to life, liberty, and security. And I would immediately ask you to think about the concept of survival rights. We are living in a period where the issue of survival rights has to be brought into this mix. Then you refer to the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular, regular Migration, and you note that the compact recognizes the importance of protecting the human rights of migrants, including those displaced by climate change. And you say, nevertheless, fifth, existing legal frameworks fall short of comprehensively addressing the unique needs and challenges of climate migrants. And finally, you present the problem that the international community's collective obligation to safeguard the rights and dignity of every individual, regardless of their status and the circumstances that lead to their, uh, to their displacement, that the, the collective obligation must be a point of departure. Now, these are the six problems you presented for discussion. I recall them to you. And you have, established, you have presented five objectives. What are the current, what is the relevant of the current international refugees and migration laws? What guidance can there be for the framing of future treaties on climate migration? What are the responsibilities of individual states in addressing the human rights of those displaced due to climate change within their borders? What international mechanisms or systems need to be established to ensure climate migrants benefit from the protection outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? And how can the international community work together to preemptively address and mitigate the factors leading to climate-induced migration? These are your objectives. Now, let me go in, if I can find my bag. Let me go and let me refer to some of the relevant literature that I had to do some, I had to do a fair amount of work for this because this is not an easy subject to. When I was in the office of the High Commissioner, um, and when I was the Acting High Commissioner for Human Rights, we had lots of interactions with the International Organization for Migration, and we had, there was something called, there, there was something called, I think it was an interagency working group on migration. At that time, I would draw your attention 
to this book here. Uh, this is, I'm dealing with the literature part now. Migration and International Legal Norms, edited by T. Alexander Elenikoff and Vincent Chataille, who is now a professor at the Geneva Graduate Institute. Why do I draw this to your attention? In chapter one of this book, there is a discussion of international, this is a, this is a book from about 2004 or thereabouts, that period, so it's, but nevertheless, it's still a valuable book because it is reasoning. In chapter one, it, it's discussing international legal norms and migration. And what are the issues that they're discussing in this chapter? State authority and responsibility. And thereafter, they're discussing free, the freedom of persons to leave and return. And thereafter, they're discussing forced migration. And thereafter, they're discussing the human rights of migrants. And thereafter, there is, not, there is a discussion of the integration of immigrants. There is a discussion of labor migration. There is a discussion of migration and development. I have a reason for drawing your attention to the discussion in this chapter. If this chapter were written now, in my view, it would have to bring in the issue of survival of persons affected by climate change and the rising oceans. So I draw your attention to the discussion here, and I draw your attention to the omission. Uh, of course, when they were writing this in 2004, so they were not so attuned to these issues of climate change and survival. Then I want to draw your attention to this book here called International Migration Law. It is read, edited by, you can look it up later on. It was, this is actually put out by the International Organization for Migration. And now I want to draw your attention to two things in this book that is relevant to the discussion that we are having here today. In this book, there is a list of Region, international, regional, and uh, sub-regional conventions dealing with the issue of migration. And there is also a fascinating discussion, and I want to, I want to, uh, I lost my page. Uh, I want to draw your attention to one part of the discussion there uh, when it comes to issues of policy. The issue that we are called upon to think through together I would summarize them as being twofold. What is the law that can help us to deal with the nexus between these three issues in the future? Human rights, climate change, and migration. What is the law? And secondly, what, is the, what are the policies that might help take us there? And now from the point of view of policies, I want to just read to you one or two paragraphs. There was this commission that was established. This book is also from the same period. This commission was established on the issue of global migration. And please bear with me for a little while. The commission acknowledged both the paramount importance of interstate consultation and cooperation as a basis for the formulation and implementation of migration policies. Notice that they're framing the issues here in terms of consultations and cooperation. And the commission continued, and this is very important, there is currently no consensus concerning the introduction of a formal global governance system for international migration involving the establishment of new legal instruments or agencies their sense in 2004 and 2005 is that we're not going to get to binding international instruments. One other point I want to draw to your attention in this book. There was a man called Arthur Helton. Arthur Helton, if my memory is correct, he used to be the deputy United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And Arthur Helton is recorded as arguing at the, for the creation of a world migration organization that would make an arbitrate global migration policy. Well now, ladies and gentlemen, we have the International Organization 
for migration. It's a different body. But Arthur Helton had the idea of a world migration organization. Question for reflection. Uh, question to you for reflection. Is it realistic that we might have a global regulatory body dealing on with migration issues? I place that before you. The final book I want to draw to your attention from the point of view of a review of the literature is Pope Francis's encyclical on climate change and equality. And in the, hey, you said something? Bless you. <laughs> uh, let those who are without sin cast the first stone. <laughs> Oris and I are good friends, so I just play with him. <laughs> the Pope is saying here, we require a new and universal solidarity. I ask you to keep in mind this concept of the new and universal solidarity. And the Pope is saying in paragraph 173, we need enforceable international agreements. They're urgently needed since local authorities are not always capable of effective intervention. Ladies and gentlemen, most of you are young people. And so I thought, in a semi-professorial manner, I would at least refer you to some of the literature, and then you will go and you will find more recent literature that will help us to think through these issues of the policies and the laws that might help us in this situation. I had another note here, but I don't know where it is, but, but, but I'll, I'll find it, something. Horace Nowasad has not allowed me to rest while I've been here. <laughs> he's, been, he's been at me nonstop, and so I'm a bit discombobulated. No, yeah, I, I found it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to address now the issue of the principles. We are in a period of, I went across the library there and I looked at a book called Power in International Relations. So let's keep in mind that when we're discussing the nexus between human rights, migration, and uh, climate change, we're dealing with issues of power, we're dealing with issues of principle, and we're dealing with issues of policy. From the perspective of power, let me address that a little bit because it is relevant to the discussion that we are having here today. As you know, the United Nations General Assembly has asked for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on what are the responsibilities of states for global warming, and behind that, what are the responsibilities of states for dealing with this situation? When this resolution was being adopted, two countries made very important explanations of both, the United Kingdom and the United States. I would like to read to you what the representative of the United States had to say when this resolution was being adopted. And why do I do this? Because it touches on this issue of the legal obligations of states. The representative of the United, Nation, of the United States says, we have serious concerns that this process, requesting an advisory opinion, could complicate our collective efforts and will not bring us closer to achieving our shared goals. The United States disagrees that, the, that this initiative is the best approach to achieving our shared goals, and the United States takes this opportunity to reaffirm our view that diplomatic efforts are the best means by which to address the climate crisis. And it goes on basically to say we're not accepting the notion that particular states have legal obligations. I think it's important 
to place this before you is when we reason in terms of the laws and the policies, we have to keep in mind the book that is across there, Power in International Relations. And we have to keep in mind also that power is being manifested all the time around us. Now, I want to address now the issues, some issues of policy. When I'm, I, I should not, rep I should, yeah, uh, I was going to breach a confidence what I said to a senior official here, but I will not, I will not do that now. When I think about how we might deal with this nexus between human rights, migration, and climate change, and when I think in terms of policies, my thoughts are going in the following direction. If you look at the literature, you will see that until now, we have dealt with issues, these issues that we are discussing here. I would identify nine methods that have historically been used. We have studied and analyzed the issues. We have engaged in consultations and cooperation. We have had regional conferences. We have striven for cooperative norms. We have striven for the facilitation through regional intergovernmental organizations such as ASEAN. We have striven for facilitation through the International Migration Organization. We have sometimes considered what is the role of the United Nations Security Council. We have tried to look at the issues through the right to life. And there has been some little discussion in the conference of parties to the Climate Change Convention. Now, you know here, you're an archipelago of thousands of islands. <clears throat> you know the impact of climate change. And you know that everyone has the right to life <coughs> and everyone has the right to survival. Morris, can I drink from the water? <laughs> no, 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 I think so. So, um, I've asked myself, ladies and gentlemen, how can we get a new framework of norms in this area? And I want to place before you three possible avenues. Hey, thank you. You can have this as a treat. <laughs> I've, I've thought about three possible avenues of action. In my view, one should take this issue to the next COP next year and present this issue as a major issue for international policy and law. In other words, elevate the attention given to this issue. <coughs> I saw that the Committee on Migrant Workers, excuse me, I saw that the Committee uh, on, what's it called, the Committee on Migrant Workers under the International Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers. They had a discussion last week in Geneva on climate change and migration. Very interesting discussion. I am told that the Philippines organized such an event at the last General Assembly. I'm a plain speaking guy and I can afford to be plain speaking within reason. So. I think that pussyfooting around with consultations and briefings and whatnot, that will not take us any place. I think we have to elevate this issue to the level of the Conference of State Parties. And related to that, I want to suggest to you, since you are so directly affected, put together, you have great lawyers and thinkers here in the Philippines, put together a group of experts, legal experts, to come up with a framework of principles and go to the next COP at the level of your foreign minister, at the level of your president, and say, COP, this is a matter of survival for us, and we want 
this issue elevated to the level of the cup. That would be my first choice. My second choice would be to examine what is the role of the United Nations Security Council. I just published a book called Modernizing the Role of the International Court of Justice. And I've argued that the International Court of Justice might be able to help us distill principles, legal principles, that can help us deal with the issue of climate change, migration, and accelerating global poverty. Well now, would it not be an idea? The General Assembly has asked for an advisory opinion on the responsibilities of states for global warming. Countries have the opportunity of making written submissions to the International Court of Justice and of appearing, uh, may, uh, arguing before the court for some principles. I want to strongly suggest to you that because this is, is touching you so much, I want to strongly suggest to you that you should tailor your written submissions to this issue of survival and solidarity and go and argue before the International Court of Justice to influence its statement of the outcome. That's my second suggestion. And my third suggestion, which would be a far-fetched one, but I do not, uh, I've just written a book called The Protection Function, The Protective Function of the United Nations Security Council. The United Nations Security Council is the most authoritative organ of the international community, but it has many problems, including the problem of the veto. Well, would it not be right for the United Nations Security Council to establish a subcommittee to help advise it how it might play a role when it comes to this issue of climate change and the issues that we've been discussing here today? So now, those are my three major suggestions. Go to COP, go to the International Court of Justice, and consider the role of the Security Council. I want to do two more things before I conclude. I'm walking a journey with you, and you may say that I'm talking nonsense, but I'm entitled to talk nonsense because I'm, ent I'm entitled to provoke you to come back at me. So, so far I've walked a journey, I've discussed norms, I've discussed three major policies. I want to suggest some principles that we might possibly build on in the future. I think we should build on the principle of the common heritage of humanity. This is a doctrine that you will find in the area of international space law and the law of the, uh, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. We're born in a territorial space and sovereignties are, exist around us. But we have never lived in a time like this one where people will have to flee for survival in large numbers. And how are we to think through this issue? I think that this principle of the common heritage of humanity can help us. I think that the right to life as a concept can help us. I think that we have to bring into play the issue of survival rights. We don't see this issue of survival rights much in the literature, but we have to bring it into the literature. I think we have to bring into the, into the discussion the principle of solidarity, as Pope, the Pope, um, um, what is his name? Pope Francis, as Pope, yeah, as Pope Francis um, uh, mentioned in the book. I think we have to play with the idea of equitable, the need for equitable procedures. At the end of the day, I'm not going to name any countries, if 50 million of your, no, if 25 million of your people have to move, they will have two choices. They'll move to your higher ground or somebody else's higher ground. But once you get into the discussion of somebody else's higher ground, 
we need equitable procedures. So I place before you some opening pr principles that might be considered, and finally, I want to place before you a few quick submissions. In my view, number one, the Human Rights Council, the General Assembly, and the Security Council should develop, notice my formulation, principles of protection for climate migrants. I've tried to give some initial principles a little while back. Number two, I think that the Security Council should exercise a protective capacity for climate migrants under Chapter 6, 7, and 8 of the UN Charter. I don't make this, it's a kind, it might sound at, at first as a far-fetched submission. I've just written a book called The Protective Function of the Security Council, and I've played around in this area a little bit, and I think we have to put the Security Council into the picture. Thirdly, the Security Council could entrust a protective function to regional organizations such as ASEAN. And I'm thinking there about Article 53 of the UN Charter. Fourth, the Security Council should establish a recourse tribunal to ensure justice for climate migrants. We can talk about justice and climate justice, but to instrumentalize climate justice requires institutions and procedures. And fifth and final, the United Nations Secretary General should establish an advisory legal panel on equity and justice for climate migrants. Young people, I started out by telling you, Socrates knew his great strength was that he knew that he knew nothing. And I have come and stood before you knowing that I know very little. But you've presented some issues to me. I've summarized the issues. I've tried to walk you through the literature. I've tried to distill some principles. I've tried to bring in the politics and tell you this will not be an easy game. And I made some recommendations to you. With that, I leave it to you to tell me I have just talked utter nonsense. And I will take it with great admiration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramcharan, for that uh, speech. And we would also like to hear uh, from Mr. Ores Nawasad. But to introduce our next speaker, um, he is a senior policy advisor in the areas of human rights research, diplomacy, and strategic negotiation. So until November 2023, he was the chief of the group, groups in focus section of the human rights treaties branch. Um, he played a pivotal role in advocating for the rights of people with disabilities, women, children, and migrant workers. His career is marked by notable positions, including serving as the chief of office to two high commissioners for human rights and as the chief of the civil and political rights section in the special procedures branch. Mr. Noah's ex expertise extends to the workings of the Human Rights Council, where he contributed significantly during its foundational phase, including serving as its deputy secretary. His leadership, sh leadership also ins is also instrumental in the establishment of over 50 national human rights institutions worldwide. Notably, he was a key advocate in the drafting of the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. His field of experience is, is as extensive as it is impressive. Having lived in Cambodia, Thailand, and Ukraine and worked in over 70 countries, this global perspective is complemented by his academic pursuits in countries like Australia, Canada, France, Germany, and Ukraine. Prior to his role uh, as uh, the chief of the groups of focus sections in human rights treaties branch, he had uh, positions in the Canadian government, the UN Department of Peacekeeping Affairs, and the International Organizations for Migration. He was also a senior partner in the International Development Management Advisory Group. So please join me in welcoming the esteemed Mr. Ores Noasad. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, distinguished 
diplomats, academics, foreign service officers, Ambassador Manalo, my dear friend Rosario, my dear friend Bertie Ramcharan. I always hate speaking after Bertie because it's so difficult to, to construct what you want to say. I'm going to take a little bit of a different tact. Um, I had a very interesting breakfast meeting uh, this morning with a woman from the Asian Development Bank who focuses on climate change and focuses on migration. And um, the migration issue at the moment, there's a tremendous pushback. And we saw with COP28 the tremendous challenges that we are facing. So while I agree with my friend that you need to take the issues forward to COP in the future, I think we need to look at a broader perspective. Because COP is not working. And that whole discourse is not working. And I come from Canada. I come from a province that is fossil fuel rich. And trying to have a discourse in those provinces that have the fossil fuel riches is very difficult. The politicians are not engaged. They're not willing to look beyond the financial pocket of what those financial, those fossil fuels provide them. So we need to engage more broadly than with member states. And I think, you know, obviously you all, because you're a foreign service people, you have a responsibility to push the issues forward. But to push them forward with also civil society engagement, which we've seen has been very, very strong over the past few years. We don't refer to it. The national human rights institutions, the national commissions. My friend Bertie mentioned the regional organizations. I have to say I have some skepticism. As was mentioned, I've had a number of years of experience and working in various parts of the world and the countries. But we are facing, in some ways, unfortunately, a global breakdown. There's a pushback. And so we need to find the way to build the momentum. And so General Carlos P. Romulo and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is our foundation. And what he did must give us the energy to be progressive and not negative. But I'm looking beyond an institutional framework. Um, yesterday when I spoke, I spoke about the importance of engaging the business sector. Crucial. Crucial. If we don't engage the business sector on these issues, it's not going to move forward. So somehow we need to push them forward in a way of them addressing the issue and accepting their common responsibility with us. And I mean us in a broad script. I'm glad that my friend Bertie mentioned the Laudato Si of the, the Pope. I'm a part of an advisory board working on that. And I should have mentioned it yesterday. What was really striking to me at the opening of the session at the university when we spoke was faith-based elements. And I think those two, that can also be a key. When we look at the conservatism in my country or in the countries of other states, those faith-based communities can help
propel a discussion. And I agree, we need a discussion. Because when I had this breakfast meeting this morning, the woman who focuses on climate change and migration was very negative. But we both agreed that we need to create the networks to try and move the discussion forward and not focus on the negativity of where we're going. Um, I worked many years ago with ADB and with IOM. I will put a challenge on the table, which I mentioned yesterday, because my friend Bertie, he mentioned the need for an institutional structure to deal with migration. Sadly, there is a reality. IOM, the International Organization for Migration, and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees compete. And they should be working together. I worked with them in Ukraine in the early 90s. And there was tremendous friction. I think it's gotten better because IOM is now part of the UN system. But again, yesterday I did say we need systematic reform of the UN system to concretize the various institutions. Um, the treaty bodies are, I, I mean, that's been my bread and butter for seven years, um, are critical. But we need to have the recommendations move forward and have them implemented. And um, again, my friend, he didn't focus so much on implementation. It's great to have the laws. It's great to have the policies. But who implements? Who pushes the issues forward? And that's where we really need to focus. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a book lover. I've got a wonderful library. I read I am pro prolifically. But we need to actually dig deeper. And that's where I mentioned the business sector. We should continue to empower our youth. As we've seen with the various youth leaders, they've been trying to push this agenda forward because they're scared to death. It's their, it's their future. It's, it's, it's going off the planet. And so, you know, I'll be dead before all of this gets, goes kaput, as will many of us. But the youth, they will still be here. In, um, I held a special session, and it's what they call an extraordinary session, in Samoa of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And it was the first time ever that the UN did this. And what came out in the main, the main point of discussion for the children was climate change. Their islands are sinking. They're disappearing. So they are very concerned and they're very um, frustrated at the ability of the international community to move forward. Um, I was to meet, I was in Malta recently, and I was to meet with activists working on climate change. And they said, look, Oris, we can't meet with you because we're working stressed out on the COP. And we exchanged discussions. Tremendous and pessimism about the COP, and we've just seen it. Other element I want to talk about is when we talk about climate change and we talk about the need to reform, we, we need to focus on conflict situations. Geopolitics is absolutely central to this discussion. So we've seen states that are earning $50 billion a year 
due to resources, which they're needing to finance to fight against another country. That's quite central. When we look at recent discussions in certain parts of the Middle East, their necessity to have resources to survive, but also to finance other countries that are aggressors, a reality. We don't talk about it, you know. That discussion needs to be held. Now, um, my friend Bertie, when we talked about the book, we didn't discuss it this morning, but we discussed something else. But I do think what we do need to do as a chapter in the book on the climate change and migration issue. Um, and it's very prevalent here. Um, we were so impressed, all of us, yesterday with the discussions and the presentations from the Philippines on, on the impact. There was a wonderful presentation by a woman from ECPAT which dealt with the impact on children. And the children are the ones that are really affected by this. And I, I said in the conversation, um, our children don't have the same hope that we had when we were children, at least I had. Um, so how do we revive that hope? Um, education, um, diplomacy, yes. Um, but l global leadership. And there is one, one global leader at this time, I think, pushing the issue on migration and the impact of climate change. But not many, you know. Um, I had the privilege of working with the Secretary of Foreign Affairs in establishing the Human Rights Council. And I do agree with my friend that we need to create maybe a different mechanism to put these issues forward. But we need those leaders to, to take it um, ahead. So finally, academia, absolutely critical to open the space for this discussion. Um, and I want to be part of that process because for me, this is a fundamental issue. Um, but again, let's, let's look at the global polity. The whole dynamics of the global system at the moment is we're struggling. Let's be honest, we're struggling as a global polity. But we mustn't put our hands down. We must keep them up. We must keep moving forward and try and move with the solutions. I'm not convinced, with all due respect, my dear friend, that the global institutions are the best avenue. I think there are other actors. Um, and. We need to, as I say, embrace those other actors. And I will start with the business community. Um, um, we put pressure on that business community. Then we can try and have a discussion. And I agree. I agree. We must have these discussions. We must continue them. But you know, all of my friends that are working in the COP, they're like, they're broken. They just, they don't see an end game. They don't see where we're going with these procedures. And that's frustrating. So I'll just close by saying this issue is not one that will go away, obviously not. It's one that needs deeper reflection and engagement on. Because I don't believe at the global level that there has been sufficient discussion about the economic impact on migrants due to climate change. But I do fundamentally support 
what we discussed yesterday and to die today that we need to talk about survival rights. And I won't only talk about climate change. I will talk about survival rights due to serious conflict where civilians are being massacred on a daily basis. And that has also an impact on this whole process. So I just want to conclude. It's always hard to speak after my friend because he's so brilliant. But I just want to thank you and the opportunity to the government to be here and to engage with you. And we will continue to engage Professor Ramcharan, Ambassador Manalo, and I in support of your initiatives. But I want to salute the Philippines because what I've heard yesterday and today, you're doing wonderful things for the planet. And it's, it's, it's great. I know Hendrik for many years. So it's great to see familiar faces. And Isa, who we spoke with last night. So thank you so much for your time and your patience in listening to me after such a brilliant orator like my friend. <laughs>
the time would come soon when the Westphalian system of sovereign states would disappear. And I gave her the answer that from my vantage point, I'm not aware of a single member state of the United Nations that would be in favor of the disappearance of the Westphalian system. And why do I mention this point? At the end of the day, after people have agitated, we need frameworks of principles or norms to be adopted by governments. Having said that, let me just clarify uh, for Oris here why I wanted to put this issue to the, <coughs> to the COP next year. <coughs> I'm under no illusion that the COP will adopt a statement giving us the norms that we want. But the COP is a way of publicizing what it is that we want and of getting a framework of norms. So as I was reflecting on this um, this morning coming here, I was thinking, imagine for purposes of discussion that bright young sparks like you in the foreign ministry here would come up with a statement of principles, well thought out statement of principles, and imagine that your president would go to the next COP and make a focused presentation on this issue. You will have emblazoned this statement in the conscious of the community. Um, the way the processes work, the Westphalian process is still out there, governance. We need the energy from the people and we need what Loris called the concretization of the norm through governmental processes, intergovernmental processes. I could say much more um, in response to what you said, but I thank you for your intervention. And what I want to emphasize is that faced with these challenges, we have to try to make the system work for us. That's my, uh, that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Noah said, do you have any uh, comment? Uh, no, no. I, I, um, again, I'm not trying to be negative, but how we make the system work is, for me, the main challenge. We're all trying, but how we move this issue forward and make the system work is something that we need to reflect more on. That's all I want to say. Can I come in back to this? <laughs> this is very important. We're good friends, so. <laughs> I have a book that I invite you to go into the library and get it. It's called The Protection, uh, The Advent of Universal Protection of Human Rights. Theodore van Boven and the Transformation of the UN Rule. In this book, I tell how during the five years of the directorship of human rights of a Dutchman named Theo van Boven, I was a special assistant, we established a special procedure system. We established commissions of inquiry. We established a working group on indigenous. I could give you many more examples. So who was it who said, it was it Kennedy who said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So Oris, go away and think how we can do this. We need your brain power to tell us how can we do this. Thank you. I'm going to come back again. <laughs> I'm from Saskatchewan, a who province knows? in knows? Canada. <laughs> who knows any of this? You know, that's that's what we need to do is translate all of this to the people at the local level, which is what Eleanor Roosevelt that's what spoke she was about. That's talking about, people Exactly, power. people yes, power. Exactly. And that's, that's how we need to keep pushing. But you and I are going to keep fighting on this. We'll do, we'll do it. <laughs> so, uh, Assistant Secretary Amuela, please. Oh, I can probably stay at the back. 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, FSI for co-organizing this event with the UN office. Um, as uh, the Assistant Secretary for UN International Organizations, we're very pleased to, to have this opportunity to engage with two of the bright minds and long-time workers. I will move here so you can see me. From, the, uh, from Geneva, Office of the Human Rights, uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, they have experienced uh, so much work uh, and have assisted in the building of, uh, in the state's effort to build all these human rights institutions. And for the Philippines, I would like to, to just uh, refer to what you said about sis the system working and engaging. For the Philippines, there is no doubt that the system that we built, we will continue to invest in them. We must continue to invest in their credibility and we will continue to make sure that they work for everyone. And the, in the case of the Philippines, it's also very clear that the conversation has to be inclusive. It has to include um, everybody, business community. We're doing this across different spheres of our work in the UN. We make sure that our children understand what international humanitarian law means. It has to be meaningful on the ground. In fact, um, in, pre in preparing for our uh, review for the human rights treaty bodies, we involve children in the preparations. We involve stakeholders. Uh, we just launched the National Action Plan on we Women, Peace, and Security. It involved everybody, and I mean everybody. And uh, I think this is a brand of the Philippines. We know how it is to be an archipelago. And uh, we have to unite all these voices in one. And uh, I, in, 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 I agree with both of you on the points that you've mentioned on these two points. But um, you've also mentioned at the very start, Professor Ramcharan, that the Philippines has, um, has played a key role in shaping the global rights, uh, rules-based order as we know it. Uh, I think my colleague earlier has spoken about our, uh, our keen interest in the UNCLOS and our contributions there as an archipelagic country. I think these are very well established. But I think uh, you've spoken about the need for equity and justice. And I think this, this is the spirit of a global rules-based order that we have envisioned. Um, you've spoken about the, the legacy of um, Carlos P. Romolo in Article 1 of the Declaration. In fact, he is also credited for uh, Article 10 of the UN Charter that envisioned a United Nations which is an assembly of free, independent, sovereign nations even at the time when most of the world was experiencing colonialism. So this is the legacy of the Philippines, a global uh, rules-based order that is informed by principles of equity and justice. Now, Professor Amcharan, you also mentioned about uh, solidarity, you know, as a as a key um, as a key factor in gathering uh, views in support of of action, global action, and this nexus. And I think I will frame my my, my the following points uh, on that solidarity. It takes time to build solidarity, and the Philippines, together with Vietnam and Bangladesh has pioneered discussions in the Human Rights Council to connect human rights and climate change, when in fact there was much skepticism on this over 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we were already pioneering discussions in the Human Rights Council, connecting and establishing the intersectionality of these issues. And, um, it took a while for the IPCC to come up with a study. It, ha it published a, the IPCC 5 uh, report that established beyond any doubt that in fact uh, human rights, uh, this climate change and its impact were affecting uh, the right uh, and the enjoyment of human rights across the world, the vulnerabilities in short. So we have that, it took us a while, but we have contributed to building that solidarity. One important issue that is more uh, pertinent to the COP, of course, especially this COP, is our, uh, you know, our uh, very well-recognized role 
as a champion of the loss and damage fund. It's something that, uh, it, well, despite this uh, nervousness on the outcomes of COP28, in fact, the decision reached on November 30 to build a loss and damage fund is, is something that took 20 years to build. You know, the, there, there are recognized Philippine negotiators that have helped shape thinking on what this fund should be, what its function should be, and uh, the Philippines has contributed to uniting views on this, and this is one of the key takeaways of this COP28. Now, uh, regarding the point made by uh, Professor Ramcharan again on pushing this issue in, in the context of the COP, uh, we do agree that the COP is still, uh, it's still a good mechanism. It's, it's, uh, it, has, it, it brings a lot of uh, the, the expectations of the world for global action. And I think it's pretty much uh, succeeded in some parts. It is working on six major work streams but I would like to point out that there have been some uh, agreements in the past COP on uh, recognizing the nexus of climate change in human rights, and I'm talking about COP16, uh, which was hosted by Mexico. It made a very strong recognition uh, for the world to cooperate and coordinate better to address climate-induced displacement, migration, and um, relocation. And this is um, reflected in the Cancun Adaptation Framework. COP27 also reached some important uh, outcomes, some consensus on this matter. And in fact, COP27 recognized some of the work from the Adaptation Committee of the UNFCC in this regard. But we wanted, in fact, uh, the president was preparing to attend the COP28. And um, we, before he decided to cancel it because of some, also some uh, matters that uh, kept him at home. In fact, we organized a side event together with the IOM DJ Amy Pope and the president of Kenya to make sure that uh, there was a, a voice speaking for this. Of course, there has been some discussion, some agreements on the nexus, but, um, they have never really gained traction as much as you know, energy transition and other um, actions in other work streams. And I agree with you that uh, the Philippines and other countries similarly placed will have to provide a strong voice in that. The Global Compact on Migration also is a, is a good um, vehicle for um, taking global action, comprehensive and coherent global action. There is a, uh, some, some substantial provisions in the Global Compact on Migration in this regard. Now, um, regarding the role of the ICJ, my, my colleague already referred to the Philippines' participation in the ITLAS process. We will also participate in the ICJ, uh, and we we are going to co-lead uh, with Vietnam uh, an Asian right shop. Uh, this is to um, you know, uh, share ideas, perspectives on what Asian countries in their preparation for their submission should be highlighting. And definitely, I think you've given us some, some important thoughts that we can share during this right shop in Vietnam. Uh, we are organizing this together with um, Vanuatu and the other small island developing states that were behind this resolution that called for an advisory opinion. Now, um, there's a lot of discussion on how far these advice, advisory opinions go, but if I may cite um, the uh, ICJ advisory opinion on Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, in fact, it inspired so many years after this advisory opinion was issued, um, states uh, adopted uh, a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons using this ICG, ICJ opinion on Article 6 of the NPT as the inspiration. So there is hope, and I think there are many pathways to producing the outcomes that we think will be robust enough 
to help us, to unite us, to keep us in solidarity, uh, to respond to climate change. But I'd also like to point out maybe two other uh, possibilities that we can shape a stronger uh, institutional framework for the protection of migrants uh, in the context of climate change. And I'm talking about the work of the, of the Sixth Committee in New York with respect to the protection of persons in the event of disasters. The Philippines is the chair of this process in the Sixth Committee. Um, and there, it's one of the several working groups in the Sixth Committee. And these, uh, they are working on the basis of a recommendation from International Legal Committee. Uh, uh, meaning that the International Legal Committee has so decided that there should be a discussion in, in the UN about an instrument that will protect uh, the rights of persons in times of disasters. And I think we should pursue that. And finally, there's also work, the Special Rapporteur Ian Fry, the newly created Special uh, Rapporteur, the mandate for climate change uh, and human rights. He was here several weeks ago, and he is also working on a document. He's calling for possibly a new instrument and in institutional mechanisms to cover the gaps that we see and to ensure uh, protection mechanisms for a new class of refugees. Um, he, is, he has identified gaps in the protection mechanisms. Uh, there are, and I think uh, we will be looking forward to his report and studies on this. And I think the Philippines is, um, is hoping that it will be in a position to be a strong voice for, for, for whatever recommendations that he's his study and his expertise will be able to share. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, Dr. Ber uh, Bramcharan and uh, Sir, do you have anything? I want to thank you for your intervention. You brought a lot of substance and relevant information. I want to make the following. You, you brought me here in a brainstorming mode. So. In brainstorming mode, I have reasoned with you. And I haven't tried to accumulate facts and whatnot, but I do want to insist on one point. We're told that the climate crisis is so severe that we don't have time. First of all, so time is against us. Last week, when the Committee on Migrant Workers had its discussion on climate change, a director from the office of the High Commissioner, I have the press release as date of the 7th of December, he said, according to the World Bank Groundswell report, climate change could force 216 million people across six world regions to move within their countries by 2050, which brings us to the following issue. There are national responsibilities, there are regional responsibilities, and there are international responsibilities. I wrote my doctoral thesis on the approach of the International Law Commission to the codification and the progressive development of international law. So I want to make this point gently, but firmly. I don't think that we have time with just classical approaches. I respect what this rapporteur is doing, some convention in the future. I respect what some of these other bodies are doing. So I am here trying to say to you that we have to react to these issues in survival mode. And in the frame of reasoning of survival, you don't have to take it. I've come here as a brainstormer with you. I uh, say so you don't have to take it, but I'm pressing the point deliberately. And this is why I think I come back to the idea. It doesn't matter how good or bad cop is. One has to put the cop to one's advantage. And it is in this context I'm saying, take your president there, let him go with the legal document, and let him say, world, we need this statement of principles, and we need to start talking about authoritative responses. So I, I've engaged with you vigorously in the spirit of brainstorming. Peace be unto you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. So we have uh, one last question from ASEC. I'd love to hear from our, my peers, uh, senior and junior. Um, I served in Geneva when it was still the Committee on Human Rights, the, the Commission on Human Rights. I also served in, in Vienna. Uh, so we, I, the first time I heard about uh, this uh, conflict between the rights and interests of one side versus the rights and interests of the others was in the debate on nuclear um, the nuclear haves and have-nots, right? So the nuclear have-nots, they want uh, the technology, the nuclear haves want to keep the technology because they don't trust the nuclear have-nots. Why am I bringing this up? Because I just came from Russia. I served there as consul general for four years and a half. Uh, <clears throat> the, the Filipinos are vulnerable abroad and at home. So abroad, the Lahaina fires, the fires in Canada, Sudan, Ukraine, they're also vulnerable right here. So where are we supposed to go, right? So I'm split down the middle because there's the, this, this um, emerging dictatorship of correctness, if I may, and people who want to hold on to their individual rights. So someone here in the audience would like to buy a new gas-powered SUV and he or she feels he or she will be punished and excoriated for not going into hybrids. So uh, the rights of the politically climate correct majority versus the minority who want to maintain classic human rights, which is right to be selfish. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> it's a debate and I'd like to join you, sir, in that storm. So the rights of the safe majority will be your human right, sirs, madams, because you're being selfish. So the rights of the majority, we want you to be safe. You don't know how to be safe. So we will impose the climate and political correctness on you because you insist on your own individual classic human right. That's a debate going on here in the Philippines. And I just came from Russia, the land of SS, so Zenitsyn and Sakharov. And they would be the first to tell us that might not be the right direction you're going. So there has to be a debate and a discussion. So, um, yes, the world is on fire. And yes, sir, I agree with you. It's crisis mode. That's the same thing Hitler told his people. It's crisis. We have to act fast. And so uh, not all, uh, there were corners that were cut. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad I'm no longer in the multilateral diplomacy field. I'm doing migrant workers, by the way, Office of the Undersecretary for Migrant Workers Affairs. So that's, I'm split down the middle. And if I am right, so you are to follow the norm and damn you if you uh, say I'm being fascist and communist about it. So will climate political correctness trump individual human rights? That's one side, sirs. Another side, yes, I already said Filipinos are vulnerable abroad and at home. And uh, the global compact is very important. Therefore, thank you to my young colleagues there. It's real, it really has to be acted on for real, not just, you know, pussyfooting. And we would like to be part of this global solidarity as a responsible international actor but we are dealing with 117 million individual opinions, 117 million Filipinos scattered all over the world. And we would like to be a global public good, but it, we have to go there wherever we're going, sirs, with our, our, with our eyes open and not sleepwalking like the Germans of 1939. Because the individual rights, I still believe in that because you mentioned Carlos P. Romulo. So if the whole good climate correctness takes hold, it should not be under a fascist or dictatorial guise. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. You know, my friend, you have expressed yourself in a colorful manner. <laughs> <laughs> and in some ways, I'm a candid guy. 
to bring Hitler into the discussion is not particularly instructive. So, anyhow, leave that aside. Let's take the issues in substance. Yesterday, at the University of the Philippines, no, no, at, wh where did I go, the second university? Uh, Ateneo, 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 yes. The question was put to me because I was extolling the virtues of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the article that says, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. This will shall be exercised in periodic free and fair elections. And what, Vice President, was she a Vice President? She, she asked me, what do, we deal, what do we do with this issue in the world of populism and populist majorities taking us in direct, which is at the root of your question. I wrote a chapter of a book on populism and human rights, and I had to wrestle with this question. Do we abolish the people, or do we work with the people? And so then it comes down to an issue, to an issue of political leadership and who can help take the people in positive direction. It's a difficult issue. It's not an easy issue. So I, do, I just want to put, place a marker against this issue of populism and human rights. Um, you know that this issue comes near to home, but I will not go there. So uh, now, I had to wrestle with this article of the Universal Declaration, the will of the people, and at the end of the day, I had to come down that we cannot set aside this article of the Universal Declaration but we have to try to work at means of persuasion. That's the first point I want to raise. Then secondly, I want to refer you to a book by a Yale University professor of political science, Ian Shapiro. And the title of the book is Democratic Justice. If you go to Plato and the Republic, Plato was playing with the idea, how do we arrive a justice. And if you look at the history of philosophy, discussions on how do we process this idea of justice. And Shapiro argues in this book, the democratic justice, that in a democracy, it is the populace that decides at any one point in time what is just in the society. It's a hard line of reasoning. But so you, it's uh, well, how do how, how do we run away from it? So now that's the second comment. You've raised important issues, and so then third, bring bring us back to the issue of climate change and SUVs and whatnot. Well, now I'll have to call and aid the the young colleague who was speaking about the voice of the people, and at the end of the day. I actually think that young people will win this argument. So no, you've raised very many issues. I've tried to do justice to you. Populism, the will of the people, democratic justice, and then I say to you to then, go away from here and pray like hell. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that formally ends our uh, question and answer. So. Uh, Ambassador Manalo, do you want to say something? Okay. Okay, so um, so thank you so much. So uh, thank you to our esteemed speakers for their insightful contributions. And the discussions and the perspectives beautiful, de beautifully complemented each other, actually, and weaving the narrative that underscores the necessity for this. And also, you highlighted the importance of survival rights in your discussions. And as we learned today, it's not just an abstract com concept, but something that is cha tangible and it's a reality for everyone and also for 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 filipinos especially because we're in archipelagic state so um um so now uh i hope that this event uh left that with left us with something to think about so uh i hope that uh this is a productive uh meet uh discussion for everyone and to 
Uh, now I would like to invite Asek uh, Almuela for and also ex dear uh, Stephanie for awarding the tokens of appreciations for the speakers. So please. According to the rules, according to the rules of the United Nations, when we work, we were not supposed to take gifts. So. <laughs>